All right, all right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. Your buddy CJ here, talking about all things automotive industry, car guy stuff. We talk about cars, 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 all the stuff gearheads love talking about. And guys, I'm so grateful you're all here, having a great time with the new podcast. We've been around for about a month now, and we've just been some extremely fun episodes. I got to tell you, I hope you're having as much fun as I am. Uh, there's been some great engagement and interaction with you guys. Welcome back, all my subscribers. If you haven't liked and subscribed, please give me a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. I love you guys. I'm extremely grateful for all of you. And listen, we're doing what car guys do. We're talking about the world of cars, cool cars, cool trucks, automotive industry stuff, uh, new innovations, classic stuff, new stuff, driving experiences, road trips, automotive events. Uh, listen, it's just been a blast. And that's what we do here. And please leave me comments. You know, as I always say, I'll respond to all the comments I can. Uh, we love respectful interaction uh, and discourse. That's what really rules the day. So, guys, let's just keep doing what we're doing. So tonight, something very special. Let's get right to it. This is going to be fun. I hope you're as excited about this as I am. Guys, first thing we're going to do is go back in time. We're going back. Context is everything. Tonight, we're talking about the Acura NSX. First generation and second generation. What that whole development and uh, rollout and experience was like. What it meant to the automotive industry. Okay, and then possibly where it's going. Okay, so we're going to talk about all of the above. But before we do that, we got to go back in time. So we're going to tell a bit of a story, guys, and humor me uh, and join me on this journey as we roll it back to the 1980s and the dawn of a new decade in 1990 as we approach the new decade. We got George Bush in the White House, the first George Bush in the White House. Okay. We've got new kids in the block on the radio. We got cheers on TV. By the way, MTV at this point in the 80s and the early 90s is still playing music videos. Okay? And let's talk about the state of Honda. Let's talk about the state of Honda and Acura in the 80s into the early 90s. As I said, for this episode, guys, context is everything. So let's take a look at it. Why do I bring that up? As you know... On this show, we look at things together, and we have fun doing it. So, guys, this is the state of the Honda brand in the 1980s. We're looking at a Civic here, and this is important for guys and gals who weren't around in the 80s, you know, come out of the 70s into the 80s, the dawn of 1990. I'm setting the stage for the introduction of the Acura NSX by telling you that this is primarily what the Honda brand was known for. They were dominant or at least significant in the compact car market, the new era coming out of the oil crisis, okay? The new era of fuel efficient, mini cars, if you will, compact cars coming out of Japan. Honda was really, you know, carrying the torch for that. They were one of the primaries in that realm, okay? Uh, Japanese car reliability, value proposition, but these were primarily economy cars. Yeah, there were some cool cars there. There was a Prelude, some really cool Preludes. We'll talk about that another night. Okay, there was the CRX, which was kind of a sporty, jazzy little number. But this is before the S2000. Guys, don't get it twisted. Car guys, don't take this the wrong way. But before the NSX in this country, in the United States... Honda was known as the economy car company. You need to know that. Okay, this was before Honda dominated uh, the minivan market, by the way. This was, I'm talking pre-Odyssey. I'm talking pre-S2000. I'm talking pre-NSX. Context is very important here, guys, because I'll tell you what. The fact that Honda, with the Acura branding and all the innovation that went into the NSX was even built... They shocked the world. Honda shocked the world 
upset the apple cart, Honda punched Ferrari in the face. Let's be blunt. Hey, Ferrari guys, you don't want to hear it? I'm giving it to you straight. The economy car company, the same company that brought you the Civic, punched Ferrari in the face with the Acura NSX or the Honda NSX. Big facts. Your buddy CJ giving it to you straight. Okay? And we're going to get into that in a minute. But I wanted to set that context uh, because I think it's so incredibly important to know, you know, who brought you the NSX. This was before the Fast and the Furious. Okay? Real talk. Let's be blunt. The Honda brand, you know, and JDM cool, JDM performance, yeah, that wasn't a thing. Don't, don't, be, don't get it twisted. This was the era of muscle cars. What was Detroit doing? This was the era of classic cars. Okay. This was the era of exotics, super exotics. You know, you, you had Porsche, you had Ferrari, you know, uh, you had Lamborghini, you had, you know, Lotus, you had some other things out there, but you, Honda was not on that list. No way. Acura, not on that list. Don't tell me about the Integra. The Integra, you know, was something else. And I think Acura developed that brand later on in the 90s, in my view, uh, as, as a bit of a powerhouse in, in, in its own thing. But coming out of the 80s, yeah, Honda, Acura, they weren't really a performance thing. This was not an enthusiast car or an enthusiast brand. So hopefully that helps. And that's just what your buddy CJ thinks. Leave me comments. Leave me comments if you feel differently uh, or, if, or if, if you agree. I'd love to hear from you. So let's talk about this thing, right? Because it's in the context of everything we just said that the NSX was born. So a couple things about this car. How incredible was the first generation Acura NSX brought to you by Honda? Let me tell you something. Acura and Honda punched Ferrari in the face with this car. I'm saying it again. I love saying it. <laughs> I don't care who it offends. It's so true. And, and I'm going to give you some of the points in a moment. Okay. So what are we talking about here? This thing, you know, debuted for all intents and purposes in 1990. So you figured they had a 15-year run with the first generation NSX. 1990 to 2005. I think it came out as a 1991 model year. But they started producing them in 1990. In the course of the run, this car had a pretty good run. And this is going to become important later. We'll talk about it. About 18,000 units for the first generation NSX were produced worldwide. Okay. What this car was all about, the genesis of this car, Honda design engineers, they wanted to have better performance than a Ferrari. That was, that was the line in the sand. That was the benchmark for super sports car performance, if you will, at a lower price point. You know, I think context is everything. I keep saying that tonight, but it's so true. Honda in this era, in the 1980s, if, if you look at their history and their involvement with F1 motorsports, both as a team, a racing team, and as an engine manufacturer, lots of history there in the 80s. And we're, it's beyond the scope of this episode to go into that. But a lot of rivers were converging here for Honda to do something really big and shock the world with the NSX, which I claim they did. What a story. So what did they do here with this NSX? There was a long uh, and thoughtful and very surgical engineering process and development process in this car with refinement and tuning. A lot went into this. We're talking about a mid-engine V6 naturally aspirated drivetrain, rear drive, okay? Aluminum monocoque construction, heavy use of aluminum in this car. Can you say innovation? Are you kidding me? Heavy on aerodynamics, Handling, and I mentioned that F1 influence, that racing and motorsports experience that Honda had coming out of, throughout the 80s, okay? All of that is relevant to the development of the NSX. This wasn't just, you know, something that was developed in a lab by a bunch of propeller heads, okay? A, Honda, some, uh, Honda is known for being very methodical, thoughtful, lead, leading engineers, 
And that was certainly the case here. It was the best of Honda. All the things they do really well and some really cool innovations made this car what it was. Okay. Also interesting is the styling on this car. Because, I mean, look at that profile and any of the history that you read on this car, you know that design engineers, uh, so the story goes, they were looking at the General Dynamics F-16, the Fighting Falcon. That's a fighter jet. Look it up. And if you look at the lines of the F-16, the profile, and then you look at the, the first generation NSX, you can trace some design cues. And maybe you say, well, wait, one's a fighter jet. And one's a car, CJ. Give me a break. No, you can see it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Okay? So CJ is going to give you some homework tonight. Go look at the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Look at the profile. And I want you to come back and look at the first generation NSXs. Tell me what you think. Leave me comments. But that is part of the history. So the story goes. So this car, you know, a big part of the development of this car Two was that VTEC engine power plant. So VTEC, and we're not going to go into a whole engineering academic dissertation to what, what all that means, but during that era, uh, coming out of this era, this was really the dawning of uh, the, the dawn of Honda's, you know, variable val valve timing where, you know, you get different, you know, different uh, operation and durations of the exhaust valves, intake exhaust valves, based on where the engine's at in terms of its performance band. So if you're at a low RPM, you're going to get a very mild performance. The engine is going to operate with effectively a low performance, if you will, camshaft and performance profile. But as she throttles up into high RPM, north of 5,000 RPM, the cam profile changes. So your intake and your exhaust valves are open for greater durations and at different points in the cycle. Intake compression power exhaust. Hey, gearheads, you know what I'm talking about. Bottom line, we're talking about variable valve timing. So it's not fixed like in an old small block Chevy from the good old days <laughs> where you got one cam profile and you live with it. You know, you can advance a retard timing and do some things maybe, but bottom line, this VTEC was really cool. And I know I'm kind of, you know, I don't want to say dumbing it down, but just talking very high level. Point being, Honda leveraged its innovation with that VTEC, that variable valve timing, giving you different performance profiles based on where you're at from an RPM and driving situation. And after it went into the NSX, and there's a whole history to that that's kind of cool, it went into a bunch of other Honda cars. And Honda guys, leave me comments. Honda was legendary for this. I had buddies back in the day who had their daily drivers, you know, a little Civic or something, and they were enjoying the hell out of their VTEC performance. And they were modding the cars and lowering them. I, you know, we'd go to lunch, and my buddy, I'll never forget, I was working for a, a media company at the time in technology and security. And we'd go to lunch in his little Honda and that thing was fun. Manual transmission. He would he would commute like 100, 120 miles a day in this thing. Got great gas mileage, but the thing was just an absolute joy to drive with that VTEC technology. And the NSX really brought that to market. Small displacement. They, these were like 3 liter to 3.2 liter V6s during their first production run, I believe. You're talking about anywhere from, you know, in the manual transmission cars, I believe 270 to 300 horsepower. Okay, I think they detuned or limited the, the, the output on the automatic cars. In this era, you did not want an automatic. You just didn't. You know, this was before dual clutch transmissions. You know, the, 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 the automatic was not really the one you wanted if you were a performance person. Now, that's not to say they weren't wonderful cars in automatic. They were and are. I'm not hating on them. But if you were a true enthusiast, you probably wanted the manual during this era. Where Honda was brilliant in this car, as opposed to the high displacement, heavy displacement cars, so on and so forth, heavy torque cars, big horsepower number cars, you know, turbocharged, supercharged, all of those things, they didn't need it. They were going with power to weight ratio. I mentioned the aluminum construction, so important to this car. Uh, it was all about the weight savings and that mid-engine design with the engine out back, okay, they were going for performance in weight savings, suspension, 
handling, driving experience, reliability. Styling. I mentioned the styling. This thing, I'm going to say it again. Close your ears, Ferrari guys, because you ain't going to like it. This car punched Ferrari in the face all day long. For that matter, when you think about like the Corvette, what was Corvette ZR1 doing? We're going to talk about that in a minute. This car... <laughs> This car was, was, was uh, stood in the face of what it meant to be an exotic performance car, a super sports car in the era of late 80s to mid 90s. A new standard was established and the game was changed. I'll say it again. Acura and Honda shocked the world with this NSX, guys. Now, I want to show you guys something else because as you know, what we love doing on this channel, guys, we love looking at things together and talking about them. Let's look at the car and driver shootout from 1990. So what happened? Acura released the NSX on the world and the reviewers back before the internet was a thing. Okay. Car and driver held a lot of weight and they still do. Here's a shot from their article. They did a shootout. You see the Ferrari? That's a 348. You see the Lotus Esprit Turbo? You can see the Porsche 911. I believe that's a Carrera 4. That's a Corvette ZR1. That's the king of the hill from 1990. Okay, we've got the Acura NSX. In the shootout, who wins? Come closer. Is this thing on? The Acura NSX wins. Ferrari wasn't even close. You know? Uh, I think from a performance standpoint and acceleration, I mean, obviously the Corvette ZR1 outpowered the NSX, but in terms of build quality and some other things, you know, the, the, the Corvette really kind of took it on the chin also. The Lotus didn't fare very well. The Porsche did. The Porsche did very well. But again, at a higher price point and kind of something different. Definitely a car you could use every day. But car and driver folks, they love that NSX. And this article, I remember reading this article. I remember buying this magazine. How do you like that? Your buddy CJ bought this magazine back when we used to actually buy magazines. Hello? I had it. Did you have it? Leave me comments. Leave me comments if you had a copy of this car and driver, because this was important and significant. Okay. You know, the other thing I want to say, guys, and I think it's super important to know, because, um, you know, a lot of times we end up, when we talk about, let's look at this again together. Guys, when we're talking about these, these disruptive cars and these innovative cars, like the first generation NSX, you know, they, they often completely upset the market. They turn the world upside down. They shock the world. Up to and including, these things were selling over MSRP. There was a bit of a frenzy when they first came out. It's always the same story, right? The rich guys are willing to pay over MSRP. And the flippers come out. And the dealers, listen, you say the dealers get greedy, but it's supply and demand, right? So these cars were going for MSRP. Um there was heavy demand, and people who had these loved them. That's what I want to tell you. Some other things, though, um, because, you know, this car, as I said, had about a 15-year run of production, but not so fast, not so fast, because other entrants into the Japanese sports car realm. How about the Supra? 93, 94 Supra is what we're looking at here. How about the Nissan 300ZX? Mazda RX-7, all new, I believe, in 1992. All of a sudden, the Acura NSX Honda had some, some up-and-comers and some challengers, right? So I don't want to take away from all those important things we said about the Acura NSX and all the things Honda was doing and high-five to Honda and how important that car was in the moment and historically in our hobby. But having said that, the water got deep quick because suddenly you had, and, and JDM guys and Japanese car guys, leave me comments. I know how you love these cars. You know, I wasn't a super guy back in the day. We're talking, you know, we're talking pre-Fast and the Furious. 
when everybody kind of got on the bandwagon. But if you were in the market for a sports car, you had to, you know, 1990, 1995, you had a lot of great options. You had this car, the Supra. You had the 300ZX mind-blowing car. When that 300ZX came out, I thought it was one of the most beautiful cars and the performance it had. I was in love with that car, and I grew up as like an American car guy primarily. But that 300ZX, I was all about it. So context is everything. Where, you know, I'll say Acura NSX smashed the ceiling and opened a lot of doors and opened a lot of minds, I think, on the consumer side and shocked the world in the automotive industry. It also, you know, came, you know, almost in a vacuum, brought some others along with it, I think, uh, which really became significant high performance sports cars during that same era. Uh, they also released several special edition cars. Um, let's take a look at this together. So let's take a look-see here. Guys, I hope you're having fun. This is more fun than should be allowed by law. Come on, I say it all the time. We are having more fun than should be allowed for car guys on a Saturday night. Who's better than us? Nobody. But let's get back to this. You know, the NSX, um, there were special editions. You had a Type R, a Type S. You had the, the Zanardi NSX. These are highly desirable, big money cars, okay? These are collector items now. Um, and you'll see them on the various auction houses. So, you know, that, that first generation, uh, just an incredibly important, innovative car. Now, having said that, the late 90s into the 2000s saw a bit of a decline. And by the time 2005 came around, it was the end of the run for the NSX. And what I will say, you know, after 2005, you know, there were a couple of false starts in terms of the development of a replacement or a second gen. If you look at some of Honda and Acura's press releases and some of the concept cars, a couple different concept cars they released, there were some teasers, right? There were, you know, I say false start, but there were some teasers around what's going to be the new NSX. We're developing something economic conditions. We're not going to spend a lot of time tonight talking about the downturn, you know, the 2008 global economic downturn um, and recession. All of that had an impact. But what happened? Let's fast forward. Again, we went back in time to set context tonight. What, what and who Honda was in the 1980s, how incredible it was that they produced this first generation NSX, the incredible run it had, the fact that it punched Ferrari in the face, and everybody else. Lamborghini, Corvette, Porsche, Lotus, forget about it. You know, it carried the torch for a brave new era of Japanese performance. Incredible. I love it. I love the story of, you know, the innovation, the underdog coming out of nowhere, if you will, and disrupting the whole industry. Love it. Love it. Love it. But uh, guys, let's talk about second generation NSX because this is where things get controversial. Let's get controversial tonight. The new NSX debuted in 2016. We're talking production runs, I believe, 2017 through... Uh, they may have trickled some out in 2022, but primarily 2017, 2021. I think they kind of wrapped things up in 2022. We're talking about the second generation NSX. Let's talk about what this car was, okay? It's a 4,000-pound plug-in hybrid with a twin-turbo V6. So architecturally, it's in another... It's, it's a quantum leap ahead and beyond of what was still, you know, what, I, what I'll call sort of a foundational kind of raw car in many ways. Even with all the innovations in the first gen NSX, the second gen NSX didn't just kind of say, hey, we're going to build a better, faster, stronger version of the first gen using a bunch of sort of incremental innovations. No way. Honda and Acura kind of blasted through the ceiling again, and we're way ahead of the curve. 
but not just in terms of internal combustion technology. They went plug-in hybrid. They were way ahead of the curve. You know, when I think about it, guys, and please tell me if you feel differently in the comments, 2014, 2015, 2016 might as well have been 20 years ago, might as well have been 100 years ago in terms of the market's appetite for a plug-in hybrid. Let me get this out of the way first. I think the, the, the lack of super acceptance and wild adoption of this car can be primarily attributed to a couple of things. One, I think the market wasn't ready for plug-in hybrid super sports car. A lot of folks weren't ready for it. And if you don't like that, if you don't like what I'm saying, let me give it to you blunt. There were poor sales of this car. 2016 through 2022, they sold like 3,000 of these. You know, whatever the official model year was, is 2017, I believe, through 2022. When this thing wrapped up, okay, they sold about 3,000 of these. I told you, the first generation NSX was a limited production car in many ways, but they still sold around 18,000 units over the course of 15 years or so. This thing's production run, the second gen, they sold about 3,000. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. Thing had three electric motors, had a dual clutch automatic. I believe this is a nine speed. No manual was available in this car, all wheel drive. Um, you want to know what your buddy CJ thinks? Should I give it to you straight tonight? Yeah, I think I have to. Guys, this car, I'll be blunt, lacks presence. If you're a car guy and, you, and it's an emotional buy for you, Yes, the reliability, the engineering, the innovation, the creature comforts, all those things are fantastic, you know, based on Honda engineering and, and what Acura can do under the Honda badge, under the Honda brand. But that's not what sells me on a car like this. Sorry. For me, I'm speaking for me here. I got to look at the car and get excited, not just from a performance standpoint, but styling and aesthetics are important. This car lacks. This car lacks that. And I claim, this is my experience, guys. If a first-gen NSX pulls in, any car meet, any car show, anywhere, any town USA, every head turns. You get, People will lose their mind for a first-generation NSX in the right spec. I've seen it. In the young guys, the young cats who are into JDM and Japanese performance and, and then coming out you know, into that whole thing, that whole scene, that's their that's their jam. They see a first gen NSX. They <laughs> that becomes the star of the show. They don't care about anything else. Like seriously, when these pull in, I don't see it. And that to again, you know, I watch people right in in the automotive enthusiast hobby, and this car doesn't garner a lot of in my like emotional response. The guys that have them seem to really like them. And the performance, the reliability, and all those things, Japanese efficiency, and all the, all the engineering that went into this. By the way, this car manufactured in Ohio. Isn't that interesting? You find that interesting? Your buddy CJ finds that interesting. These cars were built in Ohio. They were built in Ohio. First generation uh, NSX is, you know, that, that was all Japan, right? Manufactured in Japan uh, for either the U.S. market or other global markets. Okay. I think you have to attribute one of the big challenges with this car, as I mentioned, styling and aesthetics. If you set aside the performance for a moment, here's the other thing. Real talk tonight, this was a, an, a mid to upper six figure car. It's a big money car. A big jump from what was a $58,000 car in the first generation NSX at launch. This car was like 168K, 170K, 150K plus. That's a lot of money, right? So this was not the, the performance bargain. I think a couple other things that, 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 that this thing had uh, working against it was the Acura brand as well. And whereas, hear me out on this, guys, and leave me comments, let me know what you think. While no doubt back in the 90s, the first generation NSX really upset the apple cart and did some amazing things and broke through as a desirable, game-changing, world-beater, super sports car. 
and really change the perception of Honda and Acura. Yeah, Honda did some other things like the the S2000 and and you know maybe some of the hot performance Acuras, but by the time this thing rolled around, was Acura really you know considered a super sports car company? Was Acura really something that had a huge following? I'm talking about a massive and significant following, uh, a pervasive following in the automotive community. Not really, based on my experience. I didn't. I never heard a lot of chatter about Acura. The, the guys, again, that were really into Japanese cars, loved their dailies and would tweak their dailies and high rev tuners and that kind of thing. But to go and spend $150,000, dollars $170,000 for a brand new Acura NSX that looked like that, styling was a bit polarizing, I think. You know, not so much. You know, I, I think the car really struggled. Something else to talk about here? were other cars that came out at about the same time. So check this out. We're going to look at this together. We are going to look at this together because that's what we do. That's what we do. Another, another plug-in hybrid that was an innovator and ahead of its time was the BMW i8. This is another polarizing car. But what did this car have going for it that the Acura NSX second generation did not? A couple things. This car had the styling, okay? This car was like jewelry. This car was a fashion statement. I'm being really honest with you. BMW i8 was a fashion statement. It's got the vertical doors, okay? Those butterfly doors. It's got that, that really cool futuristic styling. Okay, from a performance standpoint, the NSX has the, the new NSX has this beat all day long. The second generation NSX was above and beyond the performance of the BMW i8, which is where I believe the i8 really fell off. This was not a high performance super sports car. The BMW i8 had the looks of a high performance super sports car, but it did not really have the performance. You know, it's got that three cylinder engine. Ah. You know, it's got about 400 total combined horsepower. I've driven these. I think these are fun cars to drive. They are interesting cars. They are, it's kind of, you know, you feel like you're George Jetson. Who knows who George Jetson is? I'm going back in time. You feel like the Jetsons. You feel like you're in a little spaceship in the IA. I think they're super cool. But if you want high performance, not so much. They're fun to drive, but they're not big performance cars. Here's the thing, though. You ready? Real talk tonight. You know, BMW sold around 20,000 of these. BMW sold around 20,000 of these. These are like 160, 170,000, nearly $200,000 cars. BMW managed to sell during the production run around 20,000. Acura NSX, second generation, sold 3,000. You do the math. Who won? The BMW. You know, so that's something super important and interesting and fascinating to note like Acura NSX second generation had the performance you know it had a brand in around the NSX badge it had brand challenges I think around Honda and Acura but it had a lot going for it had the reliability had the innovation had the engineering so why were the sales so poor I claim it's for some of the things I mentioned before. There's a couple of other things, though. Guys, let's let's talk about a couple of other things here on the new NSX because I think they're super important. I hope you're having fun tonight. I know I am. Guys, Corvette C8. We got to talk about it. And I don't care if this offends anybody or upsets anybody, but there were a lot of comparisons in the market. Like, yeah, I could go buy an NSX hybrid V6, a bit more conservative styling for 150, 160 K, or I could go buy a C8 Corvette for well under a hundred K and get the same performance, literally nearly the same performance. Yeah, I get it. One's a Chevy Corvette. One's an Acura NSX. They only, there weren't nearly as many of these, so it's a bit more exclusive. But still, I, I think that's relevant. Timing is everything. And I know 
you know, anyone you talk to who talks about the performance of this car, you almost have to go down market to a Corvette. Then you got to go up market to the Ferraris and the McLarens and the Lamborghinis and the Porsches and all those things. And you start comparing it and you say, where does this, this second gen NSX fit? Where does it fit? And is it something that's going to have mass and significant appeal? And the industry has spoken. The consumer has spoken. The answer is no. This car never had the mass appeal, you know? And, you know, Acura as a brand, being sort of an SUV brand, a sedan brand, yes, they do have some performance-oriented cars, but it's not like the first thing you think about with Acura is super high performance in $150,000, $160,000, $170,000 cars. That's just not it. That's just not Acura's brand identity. So that was working against this car. In addition to the price point, in addition to being so innovative, they were ahead of the curve with this V6 plug-in hybrid drive for super high performance. As a matter of fact, you talk about ahead of the curve, what's Ferrari doing with the 296? A very similar architecture in some ways. We won't go into all the rats and mice of specifically what the different technologies and architectures are, but compare the Acura NSX second generation twin turbo V6 hybrid drive. Look at the performance specs on this car. Then look at the, the new Ferrari 296s. Okay. More similar perhaps than different. So Acura was certainly ahead of its time. Honda was ahead of its time again with something really too cool, but maybe too far, maybe on the bleeding edge as opposed to the leading edge. And I think that's relevant here. The market wasn't ready. Hell, there's still people who aren't ready for a plug-in hybrid super sports car or supercar. So you got that. Guys, you know, look at the last thing I'll say is look at the C8 E-Ray. And the jury's still out on that. I don't know how demand will be. You got a C8 Z06, for example, with that naturally aspirated uh, flat plane crank V8. But then you can also get now the C8 E-Ray. Will that, you know, which is... You compare it to this a bit, it's different, of course, but it is, you know, you can get, you can snag one of those new at a slightly lower price point than what the NSX was at, but it's got that naturally aspirated V8 with a hybrid drive non-plug-in, you know, so again, a bit different, but some similarities. And that's years later, you know, this car came out in 2016, 2017, and here we are all these years later, 2024, and that's what Ferrari is doing. <laughs> Very similar things architecturally with the hybrid drive. That's what Chevrolet is doing. That's what everybody's doing. Not everybody. You know, Lamborghini's going to be doing this soon. So super interesting car again, but not a great story of success. This car was high tech ahead of its time. Significant performance numbers, no doubt. But I claim it lacked something. It lacked an edginess, it lacked aesthetics. Uh, the Acura brand wasn't helping it during this era. The hybrid drive was a bit ahead of its era. Again, you can snag these. Maybe they're performance bargains compared to some other cars right now, but it's not for everybody. And I claim the car does lack a certain presence. That's just me. That's just what your buddy CJ thinks. But I'd like to hear what you think. Guys, the other thing I want to tell you is what's next for the Acura NSX. I don't think this is the end of the Acura NSX. Honda and Acura have been sort of, you know, teasing uh, that the next generation is coming. Uh, it's going to be an EV. Uh, I think all speculation, all things are pointing towards this car being an EV in its next uh, generation. So listen, will there be another NSX? Looks like it. Uh, and you know, uh, who knows how long it's going to be. If you think about how long it took the second gen to come out, could be a while. I don't know. They could surprise us, um, yet to be seen, but, uh, I don't think this is the end of the NSX. I mean, what an incredible story so far with the two generations. I mean, two completely different cars couldn't be more different. The first Acura NSX, I mean, really just shocking the world and doing amazing things and changing the game and changing perception around what Japan could do in the super sports car and the supercar category. The second gen showing incredible innovation, adoption of hybrid drives and getting more and more performance 
out of these uh, smaller displacement V6s, twin turbos, all-wheel drive, dual-clutch transmission. Forget about it, but at a higher price point, you know, and not doing big numbers, and now the car is done. So now we wait for a new NSX, probably going to be EV. But guys, those are some of my thoughts on the NSX, the history of that car, the significance of that car. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Um, Listen, I really appreciate you guys. Give me a like and subscribe. Leave me your comments. What do you think about the first generation, second generation Acura NSX? Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. I love you guys. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I will see you on the next one. And peace.